Hi, Emily. Thanks for joining me today to talk about the guidelines for Venus thromboembolism. Such a great guideline. I'm so excited to hear more about it today. So what recommendations would you say are new or were updated? Thanks, Lisa. So with the VTE guideline, um, there are a couple of new recommendations. There are several new recommendations, but a couple I'd like to highlight, uh, specifically related to nurse-driven pr protocols. And um, as many people know, nurse-driven protocols um, are really a way to facilitate timely nursing interventions and can often lead to improved patient outcomes. So, um, of course, VTE prophylaxis requires um, an order from a licensed practitioner, but this uh, way nurses can start mechanical prophylaxis as soon as they know the patient might be at risk. So that's really important. The protocol might include that mechanical VTE prophylaxis, which is um, intermittent pneumatic compression devices and, and the benefits of initiating that VTE prophylaxis early with the mechanical prophylaxis really outweigh the potential risks. Nice. I really love that. And I really also love the fact that you include a risk assessment mm -hmm. in the guideline. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, risk assessments are not new, of course. Um, an important element related to VTE protocol, the VTE protocol is really the risk assessment. And so when it comes to those VTE risk assessments, there are two types of risk assessments that are important. Um, one is the VTE risk assessment and the other is the bleeding risk assessment. And they, of course, each facility will determine which risk assessments are best for them. The bleeding risk assessment would be developed by the facility. Uh, the VTE risk assessment that's chosen should be a validated risk assessment. And the Caprini risk assessment, for example, is one of those risk assessment tools that is the most widely used and validated tool. And the elements that are included in risk assessments for VTE typically include um, family history of uh, thro thrombosis. So that's a history of blood clots and it could be a personal history or it could be a family history. And that's uh, very important to assess. It could also include the surgical procedure, the patient's age, and whether the patient might ambulate often. So for example, patients who are mobile because of a cast or if they're on bed rest could put them at higher risk for VTE. Um, one example I like to give in, is a patient who might be older, who is, um, in the pre-op area, you're assessing the patient who's uh, scheduled for a, um, an ORAF of the hip. So this older patient might have sustained a hip fracture and the fact that they've had a fractured hip, they have an orthopedic fracture, they've been likely on bed rest for a period of time and their older age, those are risk factors for VTE. Yeah, makes sense. Um, Lots of great things for nurses, but what resources are out there to help them implement these types of interventions? With the updated guideline, we put together a couple of really great tools. So I'm glad you asked. Um, for example, the Caprini risk assessment model uh, is provided to our team members in a chart format, a table format, and that can assist with um, risk assessment for VTE. And another great tool that was developed was the um, uh, chart that lists recommended VTE prophylaxis based upon the VTE risk and the bleeding risk. And this is more for the nurses um, and teams to anticipate what type of VTE prophylaxis will be ordered for the patient. Um, of course, like we mentioned before, a medical decision for VTE prophylaxis is always required uh, and should be individ individualized for each patient. And so this is something that just um, uh, the teams can use. Yeah, nice. So what surprised you when you were updating this guideline? One thing um, that 
really was apparent was the um, the fact that um, uh, VTE continues to persist as a problem for uh, patients who are undergoing surgery. So we've improved, but we can do more. And really, effective prevention requires coordination uh, with the entire team. Yeah. Yeah. So and I'm, having thought about that, what's the most important takeaway from this guideline? So I would say that one of the most important um, takeaways for this particular guideline is the message that perioperative nurses play a key role in BTE prevention um, for our patients who are undergoing surgery. And one area that we are particularly impactful, can be particularly impactful is patient and family education. Um, one example is when we talk to patients before surgery, we're starting that education and we can reinforce the importance of uh, ambulating as soon as possible after surgery. And when we do that, the patients hear that. They uh, can also ask their family to help them with that after surgery. Remember that every patient who might have surgery should have a fall risk assessment performed before they begin to ambulate. So only if it's safe, of course. But uh, that is one way uh, through education, that we can really help patients um, prevent VTE. And we, I remember having to apply the compression stockings on patients and how difficult that was sometimes. I'm so grateful for the newer technology with the compression devices that we're using today and how much easier it is for nurses to, to uh, implement those practices. Yeah, I agree. I also remember having to put on the stockings and um, though those might be appropriate for some patients, it is so great to have something that is easy, uh, that is quick and we know is effective for VTE prevention. 